Thank you. Good to be back. Thank you, uh, Senor Sanchez. Now, at the last World Congresses of Families in Warsaw and uh, in Am Amsterdam, I presented a country-by-country -country model of fertility, which has since been published in my book, Redeeming Economics, and which I updated for last year's Moscow Demographic Summit. I spoke a little about it uh, earlier in the uh, panel on uh, demographic winter. Today, I would like to draw further on that analysis using the United States as an example of the threats and, and possible countermeasures of public policy to, and compare the likely birth rates in the United States uh, if social benefits, benefits are allowed to grow as predicted under President Barack Obama's uh, budget uh, policies compared with what would happen if they are reformed as uh, House Budget Committee Chairman uh, Paul Ryan has proposed. Is there a, uh, do we have a PowerPoint slides? Uh, th there's a, I have a control, but there's no, uh, the PowerPoint slides are not up. Well, okay, I will go ahead without the slides. Um, the cover of my book uh, features Gustave Doré's engraving of the arrival of the Good Samaritan at the inn. The reason is that the parable of the Good Samaritan illustrates all the possible transactions that we can have with our fellow man. The robbers beating a man and leaving him for dead by the side of the road illustrate a crime. The priest and the Levite who passed the beaten man by illustrate indifference. The innkeeper's bargain with the Samaritan to uh, care for the man illustrate justice in exchange. And finally, the Samaritan's devotion of time and money to restore the beaten man to life illustrates a gift. So crime, indifference, just exchange, and gift. These, this is the possible range of possible transactions that we can have with our fellow men. In contrast, today's, the premise of today's neoclassical economic theory was expressed by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations with his assumption that, in his words, every individual intends only his own gain. Neo-scholastic economics, um, what I call neo-scholastic economics, an updated version of the original scholastic economics, differs from today's neoclassical economics chiefly in retaining uh, Augustine and Aristotle's theory of gifts and their opposite crimes, as well as the theory of exchange. This also makes the uh, neo-scholastic model much more accurate. For example, updating scholastic theory refutes the famous claim by economist Stephen Levitt, which is freak, featured, featured in his uh, bestseller, Freakonomics, his thesis that the U.S. Supreme Court's legalization of abortion in 1973 caused the crime rate to fall 15 to 20 years later by eliminating potential criminals. As a matter of fact, um, as I show, there is a 90% current inverse that is negative relationship between economic fatherhood uh, and the homicide rate. So legalizing abortion uh, raised crime rates both immediately and with a lag. The neo-scholastic fertility model is also much more accurate. Uh, here I'll have to uh, rely on your memories from my presentation if you happen to uh, catch it this morning. Um, what I said is that just four factors explain most of the variation in birth rates among the 70 countries for which sufficient data are available which comprise only one-third of all countries,
but about three quarters of uh, world population. The birth rate is strongly and about equally inversely, that is negatively uh, related, both to per capita social benefits, the value of benefits that we receive uh, from the government, uh, and per capita national saving, for example, the amount of money that we put in stock bonds uh, or, or bank accounts. And the reason for this negative relationship is that the social benefits and the national saving uh, represent the provision of today's adults for their own uh, current and future well-being. When these factors are taken into account, a legacy of totalitarian government is also highly significant, reducing the birth rate by about uh, 0.6, uh, six tenths of a child per couple. Finally, though, the birth rate is strongly and positively related to um, to religious practice, to, specifically to the rate of weekly worship. On average throughout the world, in the years 2005 to 10, adjusted for differences in mortality that the rate at which, and ages at which people die, the average couple in the world, which never worships, never worship God goes to church, has an average of about 1.2 children. Conversely, a couple which uh, worships at least once a week has 2.4 more children, or 3.6 children, uh, simply as a, res as a result of the different attitudes that uh, are, go with worshiping or not worshiping. Regular worship is also, sorry, Okay, I'll, I'll just go without the, the slides. Sorry, they uh, have two copies of the same presentation from this morning. Regular worship is also, um, besides being directly related to fertility in a roughly linear f fashion, it's also inversely related, that is negatively related to the incidence of abortion. That is, as the rate of worship goes down, the rate of abortion goes up at an exponential rate. There are four main reasons then for demographic winter, uh, I found, in order of importance. First, low rates of religious practice which were associated with low birth rates and high incidence of abortion rates. Second, social benefits, which are so high as to displace gifts within the family. And finally, heavy reliance on fiscal policies, um, which penalize investment in people, so-called human capital. Now, 50 years ago, the three most populous uh, th countries in the world, that is, the ones with the largest populations, were China, India and the United States in that order. And that is still true today. But the policies of abortion in China, but not as widely in India, are causing a reversal of China in India's first and second place ranks. Adjusted for differences in mortality rates, that is the rate at which men and, uh, and women die at all ages, China's total fertility rate was 1.53 uh, after legal abortions, but it's 2.1 before uh, the abortions. China's, in contrast, is uh, uh, 2.34 after and 2.41 before abortions. So um, China relies much more heavily on abortion compared with India, and that's causing a reversal. In the United States, the USA, USA during that period had almost exactly the replacement rate, 2.01 uh, births per couple uh, after abortion, but the birth rate was 2.66, almost 2.7 before abortion. So the children are being conceived, but they're not allowed to be born. Um, parenthetically, Spain's total fertility rate 
uh, was 1.37 after, but 1.59 before abortions. It's a bit of an outlier because in most other countries, abo abortion alone accounts for the difference. Based on all 52 countries for which data are available, comprising about two-thirds of world population, the world's total fertility rate was about 1.88 uh, after, but 2.34 before abortion. So it has a, a big uh, influence as to whether the world population and any national population grows or declines. So what does this mean for policy? Well, based on current uh, projections, President Barack Obama's budget would substantially increase federal uh, social spending, social benefits as a share of gross domestic problem, product. Meanwhile, House Budget Committee Chairman Paul Ryan's uh, budget would prevent uh, such an increase by fundamentally reforming the federal health care programs. Because of the strong inverse relationship between um, uh, the birth rate and per capita social benefits, I project that the U.S. birth rate, which is now at or above the replacement rate, uh, will fall significantly under current law from about 2.1 uh, to about 1.7 children uh, in coming decades. And these projections indicate that the Obama budget is likely to shift the whole U.S. society uh, to conditions approximating what the U.S. Social Security trust trustees call the high cost um, scenario. The same projections indicate that the U.S. birth rate would remain almost exactly at the replacement rate under the Ryan budget, thus approximating the Social Security trustees' intermediate assumptions, which are more optimistic. So in general, my findings support Congressman Ryan's emphasis on reform of social benefits, uh, because without reform of just the magnitude that Congressman Ryan is calling for, uh, there will be no way to prevent a sharp decline in the U.S. birth rate and thus a decline in the relative size of the U.S. population uh, and its economy. At the same time, my analysis offers a note of caution on reforming pay-as-you-go uh, retirement pensions. Neither the Obama nor the Ryan uh, budget proposals directly address pay-as-you-go Social Security retirement pensions. But I project that substituting uh, private accounts, private retirement accounts, for pay-as-you-go Social Security uh, retirement pensions without reforming uh, medical in, uh, re entitlements would actually lead to a lower birth rate, at least through 2050, uh, under, uh, under such a, a proposal than under the current law policy mix that President Obama proposes. The main reason is the additional forced saving which would be required from the um, prospective retirees who are um, a couple of decades away from retirement. They have to um, provide for the uh, uh, contributions for their own future benefits and save for their own uh, private retirement accounts. So as an economist, I practice, I practice what has been called uh, the dismal science, but I like to es e emphasize that despite the um, uh, disheartening current uh, pro projections, my message is really one of hope because there's nothing inevitable about any of these trends. Um, all the unfavorable trends that I've discussed, discussed here are reversible if we only reverse the policy mix that caused them. So uh, I thank you for your attention. I apologize for not having the, the pictures uh, to show you, but uh, uh, I'm grateful to be here to address you at the World Congress of Families. Thanks.